A consequential decision announced in June 2022 further reshapes Chevron doctrine and administrative law generally. It is West Virginia versus EPA. The Chief Justice gave this capsule description of the key substantive issue. The issue here is whether restructuring the nation's overall mix of electricity generation to transition from 38% coal to 27% coal by 2030 can be the best system of emission reduction within the meaning of Section 111 of the Clean Air Act, where the term best system of emission reduction is found. The statute reads, a standard of performance for new sources reflects the degree of emission limitation achievable through the application of the best system of emission reduction which the EPA administrator determines has been adequately demonstrated. Best system of emission reduction. Notice the striking similarity between the issue the Chief Justice frames here and the issue presented in Chevron. The terms major stationary source and major emitting facility mean any stationary facility or source which directly emits 100 tons or more per year. Major stationary source. One of Justice Scalia's last opinions reiterated the Chevron line of analysis. We review EPA's interpretations of the Clean Air Act using the standards set forth in Chevron. Under Chevron, we presume that when an agency-administered statute is ambiguous, Congress has empowered the agency to resolve the ambiguity. The question for a reviewing court is whether, in doing so, the agency has acted reasonably and thus has stayed within the bounds of its statutory authority. In that case, Utility Air versus EPA, the issue is whether the statutory term air pollutant had the same meaning throughout the Clean Air Act. In Massachusetts versus EPA, recall, the court upheld the EPA's interpretation of the term air pollutant to encompass greenhouse gases. In utility air, the court found that greenhouse gases do not count as air pollutants for all purposes under the Act. It reached this result under Chevron. Justice Scalia, a great champion of Chevron, is no longer on the court. In West Virginia versus EPA, the Chief Justice concedes that the statutory language can reasonably read as the EPA had read it, but he continues, under our precedence, this is a major questions case. Presumably then, Chevron itself was an ordinary case, not a major questions case, so Chevron does not control. Rather, President Council's skepticism towards EPA's claim that Section 111 empowers it to devise carbon emission caps. Whereas the Chevron Court held that the EPA was empowered by Congress to try out different interpretations, the court in West Virginia versus EPA is skeptical. Does this mean that the court finds that the statute speaks to the precise issue in question? and speaks contrary to the agency's reading? No. That would be a Chevron step one analysis. Instead, to overcome that skepticism, the government must, under the major questions doctrine, point to clear congressional authorization to regulate in that manner. It is not enough that the agency reading is a reasonable reading. It is not even enough that the agency's reading is the best reading. Under the major questions doctrine, the statute must contain a clear and direct statement in line with the agency's reading. The statute does not say, EPA, you may decide that a cap and trade scheme is the best system of reducing emissions. In 
and so you may not. Never mind that a system of regulation that deals only with emissions point sources is not going to prevent the type of harm the statute is meant to address. So the major questions doctrine doesn't merely take us out of Chevron. The major questions doctrine turns Chevron on its head. For ordinary questions, Statutory ambiguity was taken as a signal to the court to let the expert agency develop its reasonable interpretation. For major questions, statutory ambiguity is taken to deny the agency the authority Congress may well have meant to convey. West Virginia versus EPA's clear statement rule curtails Congress's power just as much as it does the agency's. Congress cannot, by using broad language, empower an agency to deal with challenges that could not, at the time of enactment, have been anticipated in detail. Justice Gorsuch, in his concurring opinion, rings the non-delegation doctrine note that the majority preferred not to sound. Writing in dissent, Justice Kagan remarks on the dramatic departure the court takes here. The court has never even used the term major questions doctrine before. Recall then Judge Kavanaugh's premature eagerness to declare the major questions doctrine already settled law. And what about the precedents, Brown and Williamson, Utility Air, and others? Justice Kagan writes, And in the relevant cases, the court has done statutory construction of a familiar sort. She does not say statutory construction of the Chevron sort. The dissenters say very little about Chevron. The opinion for the court does not even bother to distinguish Chevron or the doctrine that bears the Chevron name. We students of administrative law must ask whether Chevron survives West Virginia versus EPA. Is Chevron now a dead letter? Or rather, is Chevron still there, squeezed between Meade on the one side and MQD, Major Questions Doctrine, on the other? Well, that depends on how readily a reviewing court will find that an issue of statutory interpretation raises a major question. Justice Gorsuch, in concurrence, would take continuing political controversy itself as evidence of majorness. Of course, that seems to entail that Congress is, to that extent, unable by statute to empower agencies to tackle big challenges. For such statutes are perennially controversial. An intelligible principle won't do the job. There has to be a clear statement. We might ask how Massachusetts versus EPA would come out were it decided today. Maybe Congress clearly meant air pollutant to cover greenhouse gases. But did the Clean Air Act contain a clear statement to that effect? Where the major questions leave off, ordinary questions begin. Does Chevron live on, if only there, on the ordinary sidelines? Lisa Heinzerling, Georgetown law professor and former EPA counsel, has recently written, the court has not deferred to an agency interpretation in more than six years. And in most statutory decisions, the court has stopped referring to it, that is Chevron, altogether. A majority of the conservative justices have written opinions denouncing Chevron deference, and even the more progressive justices seldom refer to it perhaps wanting to avoid the conservative justices' 
anaphylactic reaction to the idea. She adds, the seeming disappearance of Chevron deference from the court's vocabulary just deepens the legal uncertainty that agencies face in proposing ambitious regulatory programs. Well, deep legal uncertainty. Can we take away anything more definite than that? After Meade, agency interpretation is not owed Chevron deference unless the agency exercised a congressionally assigned power to interpret authoritatively. After West Virginia versus EPA, agency interpretation is not owed Chevron deference unless it involves an ordinary question. Where a major question is involved, the statute must make a clear statement assigning the agency the power to regulate in the manner the agency has chosen. 